While I was working on this rack mountable or at least IKEA leg rack table mountable version of a virtualization server for myself, I thought that it would be time to give you a short rundown of what are the minimal functionalities what you should be looking for whenever you intend to put together for yourself a small virtualization server in particular when you want to study. I have already uploaded one video where I explain the same thing. However, based on the questions on the video, it's clear to me that my explanation was not concise and especially not compressed enough in like 10 to 20 minutes. And this is what I'm trying then to do in this video. And now then let me switch over to talk about the features for those people who eventually haven't watched the previous videos of what are the features what you definitely need to make sure that your motherboard supports. Well, first of all, make sure that the motherboard accepts a CPU with Intel VTD functionality or in this case AMD IOMU, which means that we can directly bypass any of the cards what we place into the PCI Express slots to virtual machines. And of course, it should support the VTX or the virtualization extension feature as well. Or in this case, it's the AMD V feature, which means that there is a hardware support for virtual machines to have access to the um, memory management unit inside the CPU. So those are the minimal, minimal features whenever you are building for yourself a virtualization server. You should definitely not take it for granted that you can buy any type of gamer or just personal computer grade motherboard and they will support these virtualization features. And that's because earlier these virtualization features were available exclusive only on server grade motherboards and then they are slowly trickling down so to say in PC land where we don't have to pay hundreds of euros just for a motherboard you need to in advance search online and make sure that the motherboard and the CPU itself really support these features and I can tell you that in the case of Intel they are really really expensive it's most of the time better using AMD CPUs and that's because AMD knows that they are not on the top of the food chain so to say and they are catering for you by providing more functionality so that's why even in the cheapest AMD CPU you nowadays get these features right away working they actually even provide you ECC features the issue is that the motherboard manufacturers are not implementing it in the BIOS properly and also they are not actually routing the different traces what is needed for uh, this to actually work. You also have to take care that you buy a motherboard where first of all these features are being at least supported but also there is a minimal version above which these features are actually really really working for you. As an example, personally I own a ASRock 970 and a Gigabyte 990 FX8 UD5 and I bought these because first of all they have been tested already by other people and it's reported that they are working and also I bought these uh, revisions because above these revisions or starting with these it is known that the IOMU functionality is really implemented properly which is then of course later fixed in a revision however you cannot just change your motherboard's revision by upgrading the BIOS because this is really a thing on the motherboard electronically and not just in the BIOS. Talking about RAM always keep in mind that all your virtualized environments eat RAM for breakfast. So you need, in my view nowadays, at least 16 gigs of RAM for any half-decent virtualization home lab. So I have here two sticks of 8 gigs each, which in the future I'm gonna then build into 32 gigs, which is the maximum with uh, how much you can put into this motherboard. When it comes to the disk I.O., 
It is really nice also to purchase a motherboard with at least six native SATA ports. So here you see these six ones are attached to the chipset itself. But these two are already require a third party driver, which doesn't really work. Most of the time on Linux you're gonna get in trouble. And why would you need at least six SATA ports? Well, the issue is that nowadays I think it's crystal clear that ZFS is one of the best options or yeah, call it ZFS because probably for most people that's more familiar. And with ZFS now you can just simply attach directly your disks. So as an example, in the future I'm gonna attach four disks here. Then one of them you're gonna probably use for ZFS intention log. And the other one you can use for ZFS layer to ARC or advanced replaceable cache. This is for read cache. Well, the advantage is obviously that we can just plug the disks directly into these SATA ports. We don't need to spend money on a host bus adapter for ZFS. And in particular, we don't have to spend money on a RAID controller which then also would use one of our PCI Express ports, which is really precious in any of the virtualization hosts or servers, because you want to have more I.O. capability instead. So in my view, this is why having lots of native SATA ports is really a good investment in a motherboard. If you use up all six or eight, as many you have SATA ports on your motherboard with disks, it's no problem because you can install the hypervisor on a USB stick. Just stick it in the backside and it's gonna work fine. Absolutely not an issue. On the previous video, some people have asked what are the features what I'm really missing when I'm going to buy such a cheap personal computer grade motherboard. Well, I mean, let me give you a quick list of what I'm actually missing. First of all, the motherboard does not support SRIOV, so when I will buy a InfiniBand card and put it into one of the PCI Express slots, I will not be able to do any SRIOV related labs, which is totally not cool. I'm gonna definitely miss that feature. Then other thing which would be nice to have is ECC RAM. You're not gonna really get that either on uh, gamer type hardware as well, even though the CPU itself will support it. The BIOS is uh, not really made for ECC RAM. Also, the number of onboard components is really little. Namely, you have only a single gigabit network card, and even that network card is a real tech chip. So getting it working on like VMware is not so easy. A server grade motherboard of course would have at least two of these uh, Intel gigabit uh, things built on the motherboard, which would be really nice. And of course we have absolutely no IPMI functionality or so, which I mean that would be nice to have. That doesn't really affect the labs what you can perform with this hardware. Since on personal computer grade motherboards you're not gonna have IPMI, it is highly important that you have at least one native onboard serial port on the motherboard to which then you can connect through a crossover serial cable so that you can install your hypervisor and do the administration of the machine where you actually see what the hypervisor is doing. And that's because when you want to connect to any of the network ports, as an example, to access the hypervisor, you rely on the fact that the hypervisor is fully up and running. However, there are several times cases when you have to really have access to the actual main console of the hypervisor. In addition to Linux KVM, I'm also very much interested in Cisco CCNA to CCMP certifications. And for this, I also put together the machine such 
that I have plenty of interfaces so I can run GNS3 on this machine which means that I don't have to spend a lot of money and use a lot of power to buy actual Cisco routers for my lab which is really a money saver. Then also to have enough I.O. capabilities especially for channel bonding and for GNS3 then I'm gonna build in three of these HP NC 364T cards which are quad gigabit. So on one card you have four gigabit ports. Now regarding the network cards there is something which I definitely need to point out namely these HP cards doesn't support the VMDQ feature which might be important for your lab. In addition to the VMDQ feature missing, there is also another issue, namely, as you see here presented in a graphical form, so just for your information, this is here what you see, is a portion of the LS topology, which uh, you can install, it's a package. This is mainly meant for high performance computing, but I actually use it to figure out the hardware. This is here one of our quad gigabit cards and this is here portion of the CPU since the PCI Express lanes are going directly to the CPU. However, please notice that actually two of the network ports are actually connected together in between the quad port and these dual things are then sitting behind a PCI Express switch and this PCI Express switch is actually on the network card itself and if you would remove the heatsink then you can see that indeed there is dual Intel chips below the heatsink and the ramification of this is that actually your quad network card strictly speaking, is not fully separate for gigabit ports. Instead, if you want to now bypass, as an example, one of these network cards using Intel VTD to a virtual machine, you actually have to bypass both of these NICs to the same virtual machine, otherwise you will bump into issues. Furthermore, since this uh, PCI Express switcher chip here is on the network card itself, it means that when we enable then the VTD or the IOMove functionality, then we also need to then switch in the hypervisor in a extra feature on a Linux KVM is called a so-called unsafe bypass. And the unsafe is due to the fact that, as an example, if this would be a real production hardware, there is a tiny, tiny chance that the virtual machine here, running on the CPU, is then pushing some packages to one of these islands. It could somehow, the other virtual machine, which is talking to this island here, they somehow could exchange some of the packets and this is why then this feature is referred as an unsafe feature for labs is totally fine however as i mentioned you need to turn this functionality on so what i will do is that i'm gonna replace one of these cards later with an intel uh, dual gigabit card which does support vmdq I have to hunt around for those on eBay to get one cheap because they are really, really pricey. So this is why for the time being I'm sticking out with these cards here. And I have seen that there is a strong push nowadays towards 10 gig for home labs. I'm gonna tell you frankly, 10 gig is a production hardware for industry. You cannot really afford 10 gig in your home, at least here in Europe, they will skin you for the amount of money you would need to pay for 10 gig. One gigabit is just totally fine and if I really need more speed I can just channel bond. Also now I actually tested it so the gigabyte motherboard does not boot up, I have to emphasize that uh, without a video card. So I definitely need to put in some video card. 
when you put in one of these old 32-bit PCI video cards, there is actually a big gotcha, namely mine here was only have about 2 megabyte of RAM and this RAM even though it's enough to trick the BIOS that there is a VGA device in the motherboard plugged in so at least it continues to boot however the issue is that simply this video card is just not powerful enough to actually display the three-dimensional images when you go into the UFI BIOS. I know that sounds crazy but that's really the case. You need about 8 megabyte of RAM in order to get to the UFI BIOS and this is why most server grade motherboards are still using the plain old BIOS without any of these fancy UFI gears and mouse and such. So with this uh, thingy here I simply cannot log into the BIOS because it freezes when it tries to get into all this graphical interface. What that means is that you have to set up the BIOS first of all to init display first PCI that's the first thing otherwise it's not gonna even find the PCI video card and the second thing is you have to set up everything before you remove a PCI Express video card like you will have it running because you will not be able to change your BIOS settings anymore due to the lack of enough RAM I mean you can go around it by buying a Matrox video card which is still 32-bit PCI you always need to keep in mind that any type of server grade hardware even if it is just like network cards like these here they always generate a lot lot more heat than you would expect as an example I could fry an egg on these network cards after they are running for about half an hour in particular RAID controller cards and InfiniBand cards run very very toasty. They gonna burn your finger just when you touch them. So this is why another important point is that you have to then buy a good chassis which provides you enough airflow. As you see this chassis is a really really dirt cheap chassis. It's just something what I bought in a second hand Turkish shop actually and the thing is that I have made a build earlier where I put everything into a large case which seemed like a good idea at that time however the issue was that I could simply not have access to a large machine and to my Cisco switches in one small relatively small rack which I found that it's actually more important than you think at the beginning and this is why I just converted this cheap chassis by putting in some Cisco switch rack mount ears and drilling some holes in it. So if you are a smarter person from the very beginning you might think about putting everything into a rack mountable chassis for yourself. Then you might ask of course well why haven't you bought for yourself a rack mountable chassis. The explanation is very simple. In average I'm spending about one nearly two hours per day in one of our machine rooms and after I'm coming home I'm just not willing to listen to two of those tiny things rotating here inside a rack mount power supply. Long story short, when you wanna study, at least for myself, I need some quietness. I build more or less the same hardware actually it's that the original build was in a large chassis and now I put everything in a small chassis and attach some of these uh, rack mount ears from uh, Cisco switches. So using these rack mount ears actually I can install this thing now in a IKEA table which I converted into a CCNA lab.